All right, guys, picking up in the last section of our notes here, um, we're going to talk about prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So these are organisms that um, either have prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells. And we're going to start with this video. All you have to do is watch while it plays a nice little intro video between the two different cell types. All living things are made up of cells. There are many different types of cells in our bodies, including bone cells, cartilage cells, blood cells, muscle cells, and nerve cells. The broadest classification of cells is into two groups, eukaryotic and prokaryotic. There are a number of differences between these two types of cells. The main difference is that eukaryotic cells have a double membrane-bound nucleus, which contains the cell's DNA. Prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus, only a nucleoid, which is the central, open part of the cell where the DNA is found. Eukaryotic cells also have other large, complex, membrane-bound organelles, which prokaryotic cells lack. These include mitochondria, rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex, and in the case of plant cells, chloroplasts. Organisms with eukaryotic cells are called eukaryotes, and they include all animals, plants, protozoa, and fungi. Organisms with prokaryotic cells are called prokaryotes, and they include bacteria and archaea. For millions of years, prokaryotes were the only form of life on this planet. Eukaryotes came later as a result of the process of evolution. Another difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells is their size. Eukaryotic cells are generally larger than prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotes are mostly, although not entirely, multicellular organisms, whereas prokaryotes are always single-celled, or unicellular organisms. Examples of unicellular eukaryotes include amoebas, paramecium, and yeast. The structure of the DNA in eukaryotic cells is different from that in prokaryotic cells. In the nucleus of eukaryotic cells, DNA forms tightly bound and organized chromosomes. Prokaryotic cells contain just a single loop of stable chromosomal DNA stored in the nucleoid. The nucleoid is not a structure, but the area where the DNA is found. Both types contain ribosomes, but in eukaryotic cells, they are bigger and more complex and bound by a membrane. Most eukaryotes reproduce sexually. The offspring have genetic material that is a combination of the parent's genome. Prokaryotes, however, reproduce asexually. Their offspring are clones of the parent cell, which come about through binary fission. Finally, prokaryotic cells have a larger surface area to volume ratio than eukaryotic cells, which results in a higher metabolic rate and therefore increased growth rate and shorter generation time. While eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells are quite different in their structure and processes, they do share similarities. Ribosomes are one feature they have in common, but both also have a cell membrane composed of phospholipids and proteins. The membrane provides a barrier between the external and internal environments of the cell and selectively allows certain materials to pass through. Both types of cell have DNA as the basis for their genes, although the structure is different. The genetic material regulates cell function and contains the coded information that is passed on to offspring. Both also contain cytoplasm, but in eukaryotic cells, it is defined as everything within the cell outside of the nucleus. In prokaryotic cells, the cytoplasm refers to everything contained inside the cell membrane. The gel-like cytosol is a major part of the cytoplasm in both types of cell. 
This solution is the site of many of the cell's metabolic processes, such as the synthesis of protein. All right, so looking at, let's get rid of that. Looking back into our notes, um, we're going to build sort of a comparison chart here. So I know that it just says prokaryotes at the top, but you're going to make your section of notes look like this. We're going to talk about both characteristics. So prokaryotes you saw are single-celled organisms. Prokaryotes are bacterial cells. They do not have a nucleus. They do still have DNA, and we'll talk about that in a second, but it's not held in a nucleus. They also do not have what are called membrane-bound organelles. So all of the organelles that really we've talked about thus far, the Golgi, the endoplasmic reticulums, the lysosomes, those are organelles that every one of them has their own little membrane surrounding it. Prokaryotes don't have any of these. So they have no fancy organelles at all. Here's what they do have. They do have DNA. It hangs out in a region you saw in the video. It was called the nucleoid region. They do have a cell membrane, and they have the added benefit of a cell wall, and they have ribosomes. Now, the ribosomes in a prokaryote are smaller than the ribosomes in a eukaryote, but they do. So if for a moment you're pausing and thinking, wait a minute, Ms. Mack, you said they don't have membrane-bound organelles, but now you're saying they have ribosomes, yes. Ribosomes are so, so old, they are so primitive that they are not considered, they don't have membranes around them, they are not considered a membrane-bound organelle. So we find them in prokaryotes. Now the video also talked about how they reproduce. They reproduce asexually by a process called binary fission, which really looks like the bacterial cell doubles in size and then pinches itself in half. And so every cell is an identical copy, for the most part, identical copy of the previous cell. In eukaryotes, we do see that some eukaryotes are single-celled. Uh, the video gave you a couple of examples, um, proto or yeast and paramecium and amoebas, but most eukaryotes are multicellular organisms. They are um, organisms that exist within these categories of plants, animals, fungus, and protists. So the kingdoms under this domain of eukaryotes or eukarya, the kingdoms are animal kingdom, plant kingdom, fungal kingdom, and uh, protist or protista kingdom. They have really complex structures. And so the big thing here, they will have a nucleus and they will have membrane-bound organelles, the nucleus being one of those membrane-bound organelles. And the DNA will exist inside of that double membrane nucleus. They can reproduce asexually, kind of like the bacteria do. Uh, that's a process called budding in yeast specifically and then also mitosis in other cell types. Um, but they can also reproduce sexually in a process of meiosis. Now, sexually just means that you are combining uh, chromosome counts from male and female sex cells, like sperm and egg, to create a, an offspring. Here is a characteristic picture. And so you can see lots of complex organelles existing within the cell versus very simplistic. What I don't love about this particular slide is that it appears, it makes it appear that they are the same size. Prokaryotes and eukaryotes are the same size. Let's look at a size comparison. So this goes all the way back to atoms and molecules creating macromolecules like lipids and proteins. So these are very, 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 very tiny things. As we move forward, we see a virus. This is influenza, a particular flu virus. Then we move forward and see bacteria. Bacteria is about the same size as a mitochondria, which is an organelle that exists within the plant and animal cells that we have been looking at. And so bacteria actually are very tiny. They're on the same size and scale as an organelle. Here is a red blood cell. Um, and then you see animal cells, plant cells, 
Moving forward, this is a grain of pollen in a human egg cell. This is the largest single cell that uh, humans produce. And then there's a frog egg. If you've ever seen, you can see with your own eyes a frog egg. You can see with your own eyes without um, a microscope, a human egg. So keep in mind, bacteria are way back here, very, very tiny, the size of an organelle. And then here are the actual eukaryotic cells. Now the video mentioned that eukaryotic cells can fit into four kingdoms, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the fungal kingdom or fungi, and then protista. And so we're going to look at basic characteristics of each really briefly. Animal cells. Animals are um, multicellular, primarily multicellular organisms. They are heterotrophic, which means that they cannot produce their own energy. They must consume energy um, from another source. Animal cells do not have a cell wall at all, and they can take on multiple shapes. And so I've given you a couple right here on the side, but we're going to talk specifically in the very last of this video, we're going to talk about some unique cell shapes. Animal cells have lots and lots and lots of different possibilities for their shape. A plant cell is also going to primarily be multicellular, or a plant organism is going to primarily be multicellular. Plants are autotrophic, which means that they can make their own energy. They use the sun, and they take that sun light, and they convert it into a chemical energy called glucose in the process of photosynthesis. Now, being able to make your own energy is very different from having to consume what we just saw as an animal. If we look at, uh, we've seen the, the organelle of the chloroplast that is essential in capturing sunlight. Here is the name of that pigment that exists within the thylakoid disc membranes that captures the sunlight. And so this is a wedge of plant under a microscope. Each one of these little boxes is a plant cell. And then if we zoom into those plant cells, we would see something like this more teeny tiny green dotted structures. So these are the chloroplasts inside the overall plant cell. And as you look even deeper into the chloroplast, you can see darker regions. That's where the chlorophyll hangs out. There are those thylakoid discs. Now plants do have a cell wall that, that is made of cellulose. We talked about that with our macromolecules learning. And then plants also have a very large central vacuole that is going to hold water and minerals, and is really responsible for the cell shape um, of a plant cell. So when the vacuole is full, that plant cell is um, very large and healthy. It's called turgid, and the overall plant appears very healthy. If the vacuole does not have enough in it, if um, it's dehydrated, then the whole cell is a little bit shriveled or wilted, which makes the overall plant organism appear to be wilted. Uh, fungi is different. Most fungus is multicellular, although yeast is a kind of fungus that is single-celled. And oftentimes yeast as a single-celled organism is talked about because in most of eukaryotic life, most things are multicellular. So when we find the unicellular, well, I should say most of the things we talk about are uh, multicellular. So when we have the occasion to drop in some specific unicellular things, I often find that we talk about and learn about yeast. Fungal cells have a cell wall. It's made of chitin. We saw that um, polysaccharide previously. Fungal cells are heterotrophic. Just like animal cells, they cannot make their own energy. They must consume it. But what's interesting about fungus is how they consume. So you've probably learned at some point that fungus um, or fungal cells fungal organisms are decomposers. And that is true. So essentially fungal cells will decompose something externally outside of its body. They create and release enzymes that will break stuff down in their environment. And then they absorb that broken down uh, nutrients. So they're um, really digesting outside of their body and then absorbing those contents into their body. Now, the last kingdom is kingdom protista. And basically, this is a catch-all category, meaning if it didn't fit one of the characteristics of animal, plant, or fungus, it gets thrown into kingdom protista. So because of that, we see a lot of variety on 
protists. They can be unicellular, they can be multicellular. Um, there, they can make their own energy. They can have to. They can be autotrophic or heterotrophic. And because there's so much diversity here, they've actually subcategorized protista into. You'll be so surprised. Those that act like animals, those that act like plants, and those that act like fungus. And so, kingdom protista for you to know is a very big, broad kind of catch-all category. A lot of the organisms here are unicellular and like all of these up here, unicellular organisms, a lot of them live in water. Um, they, they are in need of water to move around, to reproduce, to get their own food. Um, so they exist in water. I did put this down here because this is a common misconception People often think that kelp and seaweed are plants, and actually they are not. So they live in Kingdom Protista. They're just a very large multicellular protist. Um, and so I, I put that out in front of you as kind of a fun fact, something that maybe you didn't know and now you do. Last section of notes, we need to pause for a moment and think about how unique cell structures are, the overall cell, which then gives rise to some unique functions. And so keep in mind, all of the examples that we're getting ready to talk about are examples from animal cells. And so animal cells in particular can take on many, many, many different structures. This is due to a process called differentiation. Now, differ differentiation happens as the organism is growing. So I put in utero, uh, meaning for us, as we were developing in uh, the womb, as we were growing as a fetus, as an embryo, as a fetus, we all kind of started with a lump of cells that were not programmed to be specific cell types. They were stem cells. And through a process of programming, those stem cells turned into all of the unique cell types that we have in our body. So muscle cells, fat cells, bone cells, I mean, all of these are different cell types that make us as organisms work. And so the process of taking a stem cell and sort of programming it um, is differentiation. Now, differentiation is for a purpose. It is you differentiate cells so that they are equipped to then do specific jobs. And we call that specialization. And so a lot of times these words, differentiation and specialization, are used um, in the same way, meaning that some people think that they mean the same thing. They really don't. Differentiation is a process that leads to a cell now being specialized to do a specific job. And so trying to put that together for you, trying to connect those words, cells will undergo differentiation. They will, their stem cells will be programmed to turn into different cell shapes for the purpose of specialization. So in my head, differentiation is more about creating a different structure for a cell. And specialization is now that the structure is a particular way, the cell can do a specific job. So I relate these words. Differentiation to me is about the structure of the cell. Specialization is about the function that the cell can now do because of its structure. So I want to give you a couple of examples of animal cells that are highly specialized, which means they look really, really, really different. This is a neuron. A neuron is the primary cell in our nervous system, and it is very, very unique. Now, I know we typically look at the structure of something first and then talk about its function, but I want to approach this next section a little bit backwards. So I'm going to tell you what the cell does, and then once we know what the cell does, we're going to look at its structure and kind of go, oh, that's why it can do what it does, because it has this and this and this and this structurally. So a neuron's job is to relay or pass electrical and chemical signals from one nerve cell to the next nerve cell, sort of in this relay process until ultimately a nerve cell reaches the brain or spinal cord and that information can be processed and then we can then respond um, using a different uh, motor neuron. 
So because this is the job, let's look at its structure. So this is, we have sort of the traditional cell body with the nucleus, but look at all these little arms that are reaching out. And then this big, long, almost, it's the middle of, it's called an axon. And then it ends in all these little different branches. So structurally, we see multiple branches coming off the cell body that are that can make connections to other neurons. Now remember that's the job of a neuron is to pass or relay a signal. So one neuron can gather information from many other neurons in the vicinity and can relay that signal and we can, we can get way more detailed about even the components wrapping this axon help to pass the signal very very quickly. So as a general concept, what I hope you see in this is that a neuron looks very, very different, but it looks very different for a purpose. And that is to extend out all of these arms to collect signals so that maximum amount of signals can be sent in this functional process of relaying a message to the brain. Let's look at a red blood cell. Red blood cell is a crazy cell that I like to talk about because it doesn't have a nucleus. What eukaryotic cell doesn't have a nucleus? This one. And that's that, that's about it. So red blood cells actually, because they don't have a nucleus, they're constantly being created in our bone marrow. And they live for around 90 to 120 days, at which point they start to break down. They cannot replicate themselves because they don't have a nucleus to trigger the process of mitosis. And so we have an organ in our body called the spleen, which will break down these red blood cells and recycle the components. And it's totally fine that our red blood cells are being broken down because guess what? As these are broken down, new ones are being created from our bone marrow. So it's just a little fun fact on a red blood cell. But what do they do? They deliver oxygen to cells and tissue using the circulatory system. So think about if the job of this red blood cell is to deliver oxygen, it needs to be full of something that can attract to and hold on to oxygen. So there's a structure to fit. In this red blood cell, you have a protein called hemoglobin. So recognize this as a quaternary structure protein called hemoglobin. And there are little spots on hemoglobin where oxygen likes to dock. And so hemoglobin attracts oxygen, holds on to oxygen, and then as the overall cell travels through your blood vessels, that oxygen can then be distributed out into your body. And while we're talking about the overall cell, look at the, the, the shape of this red blood cell is very important. It's called a biconcave disc, which really means it's almost like a donut whose middle has not been poked all the way through. Looks like it's just been pinched. That's increasing the amount of surface area on the red blood cell for diffusion of oxygen into and out of it. And then inside, it's packed full of these hemoglobin proteins, which are attracting oxygen. Also look at the shape of that red blood cell. It travels nicely in these tubes in our circulatory system. So because of its shape and because of the hemoglobin inside having an affinity for or a liking of oxygen, red blood cell can do its job. Highly specialized, specifically designed to deliver oxygen out into our body using the tubes in our circulatory system. Next cell is called a sperm cell. So sperm cells are male sex cells. Now, male sex cells and female sex cells are only going to have a half count of chromosomes because they're going to combine with the sex cell of the opposite sex, in this case with a female egg cell, to create, restore the full chromosome count and create an offspring. So what is the job of sperm? The job of sperm is to deliver that DNA to the egg cell. It has to move that DNA to the egg cell. So if we look at the structure that fits it, here's the structure of a sperm cell. It's very simple. It's just made of three parts. The head, which carries the DNA, it's protected. The mid piece, which is packed full of mitochondria, and then the tail, which is a big, long flagella. So think about why would the midpiece structurally be loaded with mitochondria? To create energy for this tail to move the DNA 
to the egg. So the presence of the tail allows for locomotion and the mid piece with mitochondria provides energy for that tail to move. Nice size perspective here. This is a human egg cell. There's the sperm. So it's very, very male gametes are very, very tiny compared to female gametes. Last cell type is I chose uh, a cell that lines your small intestines. So this is an intestinal epithelial cell. So the function of the cell is to absorb digested nutrients from your digestive system. And so if we are trying to absorb something, let's look at, this is the overall cell. Looks pretty typical, except you have these projections. So these projections up here are what we see in this picture. So these are villi. These are increasing the surface area of the cell. More surface area means more absorbing. And what's really cool is that the dark pink border around each of these villi are even smaller villi to the villi. And so we see additional increased surface area. So a structure to fit, we have a villi, we have these little finger-like projections coming off the top of an epithelial cell for increased surface area. And then we even have villi on the villi, which are called micro villi. Here is a picture of what I just said. So here's the full-on digestive system. Here is small intestines, a small section of the small intestines. These, the inside of the small intestines is loop, 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 looped to increase surface area. And then here are the villi on the surface. So if we zoom in, here is one villi to increase surface area for absorption. And then if we look at the surface of the villi, we have even more microvilli. So it's all about increasing surface area for absorption. So the long and short of this, as we kind of wrap up 2.1 and 2.2, is that um, cells are unique. We've learned about the organelles that exist within the cells. We saw the difference between the two broad categories of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And then we dug in a little bit into the four kingdoms that exist within the eukaryotic world. We wrapped here with noticing that cell types are not all the same. And really that's a great thing because as the structure of the cell changes, so does the function that that cell can actually um, accomplish. All right. That's the end of your notes for this section.